What up, what up? Wimbush here. And today I'm excited to show you guys my Unreal Engine workflow for working in film and broadcast. Now, for those that don't know me, my name is Jonathan Wimbush. I'm a motion graphics artist based here out of Southern California. I've worked on a lot of movies and television shows for studios such as Marvel, DC, Warner Brothers, Hasbro, and a whole lot more. A lot of people might know me from YouTube where I've been teaching the whole industry how to add Unreal Engine into the motion graphics and VFX pipeline in which right now on my YouTube channel, I have a brand new course that just released called Learn Unreal Engine 5 in five days. In this course, I take you from absolute beginner to being able to make your own project files. Everything is project based, so you should be a master at the end of it. The Maxon Suite and of course Unreal Engine, which a lot of you guys might know me for. And thanks to the Epic Mega Grant, next week I'm going to be releasing my brand new course absolutely for free via YouTube called Unreal Engine 5 in five days. And so basically this course is going to be all project based. So at the end of each chapter, you'll have something tangible at the end of the day. If you've never used Unreal before for motion graphics, you should be able to go from zero to hero and be able to render stuff out in no time using some of my workflows that I've developed over the past couple of years. Now, this past summer though, I had another YouTuber that's known in the Cinema 4D space. His name is EJ, AKA iDesign. And like he runs the head of 3D for School of Motion and a lot of his students were interested in Unreal Engine. And so he was like, can you teach me so I, re I could reciprocate that to my students? And so I did like a three hour podcast as I'm working in Unreal Engine and he's kind of going and commentating saying like, hey, if you're a Maya, you would do it this way. Or if you're in Cinema 4D, you would do it this way. And we were just kind of having like a back and forth, which everybody seemed to love. And they wanted to try it out for themselves. And so we thought it'd be cool to make it into a challenge out for the CG and motion graphics community. And we called it the Unreal Challenge. Basically, we took one asset that we created, which is a pug statue, because we both love pugs. And we were like, you just have to follow this template of having a pug in the scene, in the same space, and follow the camera movement. So everything will be flushed out in the montage. And I'm gonna play a couple of minutes of the top submissions that I thought was really cool because the main thing that we took from it was a lot of people messaged me saying, this was the very first time they've ever touched Unreal Engine. They might've came from like a Maya background or a Cinema 4D background or even After Effects. And they've always been interested in using Unreal for CG and motion graphics work. And this gave them the incentive to kind of hop in and create something. And over the past two months, this is some of the stuff that people created, which I'm really proud about because it shows you the power of how easy it is to teach somebody that has the basic background of design and animation.
Yeah, I just wanted to showcase there some of the top entries there. And the biggest thing that I took to heart was we had about 100 entries for that competition, and maybe 80% of them said this was the very first time even using Unreal, let alone outputting something to that caliber. So I thought that was just amazing and a testament to how easy this stuff is as long as you have a basic understanding in the background in the arts, you know, color theory, compositing, 3D, then this should be easy to translate over to your workflow. So moving on, this is something that I've used, like I've been doing this for the past 15 years, so this might look familiar to a lot of you guys. Like this is typically the motion graphics workflow. Like, you know, if we do a lot of logo animation, you might get it as a vector file. You would extrude it in something like Cinema 4D or Maya, and then you would export it out using GPU rendering, something like Redshift or Octane. And then from there, take your compositing layers into After Effects and then output it from there for either like streaming services, theatrical VR headsets, or whatever medium that you're exporting to. But now, over the past couple of years, I've absolutely decimated any GPU rendering out of my system at all, which my wife loves because I'm saving a lot of money on the electric bill now. So I no longer have like a home render farm with like a ton of GPUs and just stacking and doing all types of crazy configurations in the house. Now typically I would go, you know, take the vector in, um, imagery, bring it over to cinema still, extrude it, do some basic animations there. Then I would bring it over to Unreal, where now I'm pretty much doing 80% of my work. And from there, if I need to, I would do some exporting out, maybe with like crypto mats or, you know, like a reflections pass or something like that, send it over to After Effects. And then from there, the client's usually happy because I'm working more fast and efficiently and I could take notes more on the fly, which is a gift and a curse at the end of the day, because once they saw how fast I could turn stuff around, you know, the clients, they get kind of crazy with it. But everybody's been happy with this workflow for the past couple of years. And so I wanted to do a live demonstration kind of showing you guys how I use my workflow using Cinema to Unreal to After Effects and showing you guys how easy it is to complete. And so for my example, I created something specifically for this. And so I took some Fortnite footage from the latest trailer and I did a simple animation with the Unreal Engine logo here. So as you can see, I'm utilizing 3D from Cinema 4D. I'm utilizing After Effects and I'm doing just a small, elegant logo animation as you can see there. But the main things I wanted to show you guys was we could do compositing like how we're used to using the offline renders and stuff. Like you can see, we have the Fortnite footage kind of living inside the U right here. And I'm able to get this to separate using crypto mats, which they added, I believe, in like 4.26. But crypto mats is very powerful for what we use in our field because we're able to control a lot of the masking and everything once we bring it into our post effects like After Effects or Nuke or whatever you're using on the back end there. So this is a testament how we can add Unreal to our pipeline is still use the tools that we're used to using every day within our job field. So with that, I'm going to open up Cinema 4D. Let me exit out of this first. And for time's sake, I already built out the logo here, but basically I got the Unreal Engine logo right from their website. It was just a vector EPS. And what I did was I brought it into Cinema 4D and you can see that I just took the basic splines here and I extruded them. And so the reason that I have my logo is just red and black is because I like doing a lot of my texturing within Unreal Engine now. I don't do any texturing inside of my DCC. Basically, I will take, like, if I know I want something to be a specific color, I'll just make that solid color to represent that. And then when I bring it into Unreal Engine, I know that, okay, if I have a green, maybe I want to change this out for foliage, or in this case, I'm going to be using all metallic textures just to give it that shiny, glossy look. And so from here, let's actually just start to animate this out. So if I come down here to my timeline, I'm just gonna come up here to about 90 frames, and I'm just gonna start laying some keyframes in here. So I don't know if anybody's familiar with Cinema 4D in here, but we have our attributes panel down here in the lower right-hand side. This should be very familiar for anybody using any 3D program. So I'm just gonna start laying in some of these keyframes here, just doing a simple animation. So let's say, move it that way by 90, in here by negative 90, like so. And then I'm gonna lay some more keyframes in here. Then I'm just gonna play this back. I have it playing back at a smooth 24 frames per second. 
But we have this like a simple, elegant Lego animation. I do this a lot for like video game trailers or even like TV bumpers, things of that nature. And so we have this nice, elegant move. And let's say we want to use the circle as our transition to wipe the footage off of the logo there. So I'm just going to take my circle extrusion here, go back up 90 frames. And let's say I'm going to leave the keyframe here at zero on this mark. Then I'm going to come all the way back to the beginning. And let's say, okay, so I'm going to move this by 90 degrees, the keyframe here. And then I'm just going to play this through again. And there we go. So we have a really basic, simple, elegant logo animation. And we're just going to start by having our camera in that this end position here. But I'm going to lay my keyframe at 90, let's say on my Z axis here. And then I'm actually going to do the X as well. Because what I want to do is I want to have my camera actually start living within like the crevice of this U right here. So that's where we can have our footage. And as we're pulling back, we'll see the footage kind of merge into the logo. And then it's going to finally wipe off there at the end. So let me just come back here. And I'm going to move my camera in like so. And then I'm also going to move it a little bit to the right on the X axis. And just move it so it's just filling up the full screen there because we want to make sure since we're going to be using our logo as the map, we want to make sure that it encompasses the entire screen there. And let's say maybe like 45 on the, Z, on the X there. I'm just going to play it back one more time. And there we go. So we have a very simple movement. We have a simple camera animation. It looks elegant. It'll look great with sound design. And let's say that we're happy with this now and we want to export this over to Unreal Engine because that's where all the fun and all the texturing and lighting and compositing and stuff that we're going to do. And so say we're happy with this right here. The next step from here is I'm going to hit Control D on my keyboard. And that's just the shortcut to bring up my project's um, attributes down here. Because right here, we have this tab called Cineware. Now, I don't know for anybody that's not a Cinema 4D user, we can actually bring in native Cinema 4D files into Unreal Engine using the Datasmith plugin which is really cool because it takes a lot of the guesswork out if you're just trying to export out with FBXs and things of that nature. It will actually translate all the keyframes and do the hard work for us, and everything should be absolute from Cinema 4D. And so with this Cinema tab here, I already have these clicked on, but you know, for one, want to make sure you have Save Polygon Cache on. That's going to be absolute because we need that for Datasmith plugin, Save Animation Cache, because what that's going to do is actually translate all the keyframes 40 into Unreal Engine whenever we're ready, and then save material cache, which I'm not doing any texturing inside of Cinema 40 as I alluded to before, but if you did do any texturing in here, you would just click on that, and then you could change your resolution, you could change your format, and you can make it 16 or 8-bit, depending on what you're trying to do. And so from here, I'm going to come over to file, and in the past, maybe like 2019-ish, when this first came about, you would have to save your project for Cineware, or back then it was called Save Project for Melange, which would make your pro it would make your project file even like a couple of gigs, like because it's actually like translating every single thing inside of um, Cinema 4D and making an absolute keyframe for it, which could be pretty heavy. But now with the recent updates, we can actually just save the regular project, and we don't have to do any of that extra stuff. Like we can just take native Cinema 4D files into Unreal Engine, which I'll show you here in a moment. So I'm just going to name this one Unreal Fest underscore version 2, because I had a previous version when I was practicing earlier. So I'm going to just click Save. And before I move on, I just want to make sure that I have my resolution and my frame rate intact, because it's going to bring over that information as well. So if I look down here, I'm working at 24 FPS, which I want to do. That's ideal. And then coming up here to my render settings, Make sure I'm working in HD, 1920 by 1080. And then for frames right here, I'm going to click on all frames. I'm just going to hit Control S again, and everything should be good. So now I can close out After Effects, and I can actually open up Unreal Engine here. And for those that aren't familiar with the Unreal Engine project browser, we now have this, um, this template here that we could use for film, video, and live events, in which in the past, you usually had to use like a gaming template and then just start decimating and deleting stuff out. But now, with the recent updates, I believe they added this in like 4.26 or 2.7, we now have a template for people that do broadcast and VFX. And what this is going to do is 
it's going to turn on a lot of the plugins that we need too, especially for like the movie render queue. If you want to do multi-pass rendering, all that stuff is going to be automatically on. If we want to do like HDR backdrop, stuff that you would have to typically turn on like uh, by hand in the past, it's now going to be on for us and it's going to have the tools and the assets that we need as motion and VFX artists. So I already have a project already set up, but typically I would just come here, I would start a blank project and then I would turn on ray tracing of course, but I'm gonna to go to this one because I have a couple of things already downloaded in here for my materials. So I'm just gonna click open. I'm gonna give this a moment to open up. <clears throat> this should go pretty fast here. It's a pretty beefy laptop, so. No, you just save it perfectly as just a Cinema 4D file. So that tab, when I hit Control D and went down into the project browser, you just wanna make sure you turn on those attributes there and you should be good to go. And so from there, let me actually close my content browser. This is gonna be the blank slate that we have here inside of Unreal Engine. So I'm gonna get rid of some of the stuff that I don't need, like the player start in the floor. Then I'm gonna come over here, right click, make a new folder, I just, I have to do organization. If anybody takes your project file after you, they'll let you for it. So it's always good to just practice organization right off the bat and just make folders to make everything organized here inside the real outliner. And so from here, since I have everything inside my folders here, the next step from here is if I come up to this cube with the plus sign, I have the DataSmith plugin right here. And this is how I'm going to import my Cinema 4D file into Unreal Engine. Now, by default, this, this is one plugin that's not gonna be turned on because not everybody's a Cinema 4D user. So if you come into Unreal and you need to bring in the Datasmith, it's as easy as coming up to edit, come, in, come down here to plugins, and then you would just type in C4D. And then that's gonna bring up the Datasmith C4D importer. You would just click it on. It would ask you to restart Unreal Engine, and then everything will be activated. So moving back on, I'm gonna come over here to the Datasmith importer. A file import, and then I'm going to go to my desktop and look for that one that I just saved out. So UEFS underscore version two, click open, and then I'm just going to put it regular. I'm just going to put it in my normal content browser and click OK. And that's going to bring up the DataSmith import options in which I just leave everything on by default because there's something cool that we can actually do. We can actually go back and forth between Cinema 4D and Unreal Engine if we want to. So say that if I wanted to, like later on after I import everything, if I only wanted to change up my camera move, I could go back to Cinema 4D, change up only that camera move and make sure I have only that clicked on and then it will repopulate your scene with just that change and leave everything else intact. But for the initial import, I'm gonna leave everything turned on. I'm gonna click on import here. And depending on the size of your scene, this can take up to a couple minutes, but since we're doing like a simple logo animation, it comes in fairly quick as we just saw now. And so I see down here in the content browser, it actually added a folder that says UEFS, uh, UEFS underscore version two. And so it's gonna make the folder correlate with your Cinema 4D project file. And actually let me dock this in here so it doesn't go down. Then I'm gonna make these icons a little bit smaller so they're easier to see. And so I'm just gonna walk through what it actually brings over from Cinema 4D files or from the Cinema 4D project. So this is our data smith scene. So this is gonna be alluding to what I was saying earlier. Like if I right click and then click on re-import, you can actually re-import your assets or your changes from Cinema 4D and then it will automatically update here in Unreal Engine, which is a cool feature. And then it's also, if you have any materials, it's gonna bring those materials over that correlate with your object as well. You have your geometry that comes in there as well and everything is in tech in our viewport. So if I click on here, you can see that it brought everything in as it needed to, but if for whatever reason you want to change these out or whatever, you have the flexibility there to do it. And then we also have an animation tab, which is gonna bring us automatically to our sequencer, AKA our timeline, if you're used to working in a DCC or something like After Effects. So if I double click on the clipboard here, you can see that it brought up our sequencer. And if I click inside of our camera and just click play, now you can see it's bringing everything absolutely over from Cinema 4D. And if you look down here inside of our sequencer timeline, every single keyframe is being baked out. And so that's what the Datasmith plugin is gonna do. 
is you realize inside Cinema 4D, we only laid down maybe two keyframes per parameter, but what Unreal Engine is doing is it's actually baking all those keyframes in there so that there's no type of mishaps in the interpretation when it brings it into Unreal. And so, like, if, like I was saying before, if you needed to make like any changes with your camera, you have the flexibility of actually coming down here and deleting keyframes and reanimating in Cinema or in Unreal if you want, or if you wanted to do it in Cinema, you can make the changes in there and then just re-import and everything will update here inside of here. So moving on, I'm gonna move over to the texture and portion of it. So before I do that, I'm gonna click save all because it's always a good habit to save all because you just never know. And so from here, I'm gonna add some mega scan materials that I downloaded earlier. But if you're not familiar with Unreal Engine 5 and the recent updates, the Quixel Bridge mega scan bridge here is actually imported, or it's actually inside of Unreal Engine 5 now. So you just come up to here, hit Quixel Bridge, and I'm not hooked up online, but it should show all the assets that I have downloaded to this computer. And so if you click on this little computer box right here, you can see these are the two materials that I'm gonna be using. I already have these imported in my project file here, but it's as easy as just clicking and dragging a lot of these assets on the here, like the Megascans library being integrated in the Unreal Engine 5 was great. It's one of those things that was um, a hassle in the past because you had two different applications, but not everything is integrated and it's good. So I'm just gonna start by just clicking and dragging some materials onto my object here. And that's the easy way to do any type of texturing or if I actually click on my item here, if you come over here to the details panel and scroll down, you can see that we have a material slot for each one of those material instances that I laid out inside of Cinema 4D. So you can see right here, we have the black ones and that's where I had the texture, the black texture, just to represent like the faces. And then I had the red textures to represent my bezel, so or my bevel. So I can basically just come down here to my details panel and just start swapping these in here and have like a silver material as well. And I'll just start swapping these out. And this is typically how I work. Like even if I'm doing like a nature scene or a terrain scene, I would still not do any of my texturing inside of cinema if I need to like do any gray boxing or anything in there. I would typically just use solid colors. And then once I bring it into Unreal, I would either do my PBR materials in Unreal or I would use assets from the Link of Scans library. Because as you get used to using Unreal, the material, um, the material nodes are actually really powerful and they're not that hard to use, especially if you're coming from like a Redshift or an Octane background where you have to do um, render nodes and stuff anyway, everything should just feel right at home. It's just all about learning how the different systems and the mechanics work. But basically everything's the same there and you should feel right at home. It's just a little bit of, you know, putting those reps in, getting in the work and making everything work out for you. But before I move on, I'm actually going to take my Cinema 4D files bring them into my C4D folder here, organization, like I said before. And now let's kind of play back and see how this is playing back with our nice shiny materials on here. So I'm going to come back down here to my sequencer, click play. And it's starting to really shape up there. We have the nice elegant move. We have the nice shiny materials in here and everything. But I like really shiny materials because, you know, a lot of clients will just ask for like that the high class gloss, especially when you're doing stuff like this. And so with the mega scans library or with their materials, the reason I like using them is because they do a lot of the heavy work already for us. So I'm going to show you guys what I mean here in a minute when it comes to using the different attributes, like we don't have to do any of the, the, um, the nodes and stuff like that to bring in the attributes. Like if you look in our parameter grid right here, everything is already set up for us. So we can come in and we can just start clicking and messing around with the attribute numerical numbers here and just getting it to where we wanna be. So if you look under global, you have the talent function, which you have right here and you can tell your materials. Or in my case, I wanna make this a little bit more shiny. So I'm gonna come down here to my roughness pass and let's say I'm gonna make the roughness max at like 0 0.2. And now we have a super shiny material in which a lot of clients are really happy with. So I'm just gonna click save. And now as I play through here, you can see our material has that extra sheen to it that a lot of clients like. And so moving on, I'm gonna actually render the, or not render, I'm gonna light this with an HDR because I think having the HDR in there and the reflecting pass 
usually helps just give it that production value and that shine that we need. So I'm gonna come back over here to Content Browser, and then I'm gonna right click, I'm gonna make a new folder for HDRI. Then I'm gonna click Save All. And this is something that people often ask me on YouTube. Like most people would usually come over here to the box, you would come down here to your lights, and they would add like a HDRI backdrop, which looks pretty good, right? So let me actually come over here, the HDRI backdrop, and it's gonna have like the default HDR in here, which could look pretty good on our scene here, but the only caveat with this is if we're using a HDR that you can actually see inside of your scene, that's gonna render out with your camera. Like if you wanna render out an alpha channel, this wouldn't be an ideal way to do it, even though it does look good, you're still getting the reflections and everything and you're getting the lighting parameters. Whenever you go to render it, everything that you see in camera there is gonna render out as well. And so a way that I discovered how to actually render it out with Alpha Channel is we can actually just use the skylight here. We actually have down here in our source type, you can actually add HDRs in there and that's gonna bring in the HDR lighting parameters, but we still will be able to render out with the Alpha Channel in case you need to give the logo to like the network or anything like that, in case they just wanna put like a bumper over top of footage, that's gonna be the most ideal case that we need or if you wanna do any compositing afterwards. So I'm gonna click save all here just to save it. Then I'm gonna add my HDR in which I got free HDRs from this website called polyhaven.com. They have like a whole plethora of like hundreds and hundreds of free HDRs. They go everywhere from like 1K up to 16K. So that's polyhaven.com. Definitely would recommend them because they have a ton of HDRs and it's all donation based. So if you wanna support them, you could just donate to their cause there. And before I add my HDR, I'm gonna get rid of my sky sphere because I wanna do strictly lighting with my HDR in this case. So I'm gonna click back on skylight, come down here to source type, and then I'm gonna click on specify cube map. So once I select that, you can see our scene is totally black right now. And that's because it's waiting for our HDR to pull in the lighting parameters to kind of light from. So it's as easy as left clicking and dragging it over here to cube map. And now our scene is completely lit by the HDR, plus we have the alpha channel in there as well. So if I come back here, you can see we're still getting all the reflectance inside our material, all the black in the background that's representing our alpha channel. And we're able then to send this out to, as I'm gonna do here in a moment, out the After Effects to do final compositing, and we have our alpha channel intact. And so before I do that, I'm actually going to turn back on my light source because I want to kind of give maybe some glint around the edges here and everything. So I'm going to make this movable. So everything is dynamic lighting. And then a shortcut, if you select something inside your scene and you hold down control plus L, that brings up like this little sundial here in the corner. And if I move my mouse around, you can actually see that it's rotating the light source. It might be a little bit hard to see because I'm using the HDR, the light for the most part, but you can see we're moving our light just like a sundial there. That looks pretty cool. So I just wanted to do this just to get some rim lighting from the back there, something like that. We can see the rim light in the top right hand corner. And then from here, I think I'm gonna add a post process volume because I wanna render this out without motion blur as well. Plus I wanna turn down the exposure just so there's no funny business whenever we go to render this out in our sequencer. So in order to do that, I'm gonna come down here, the visual effects, and then I'm gonna click on this, which is post process volume. So I'm gonna center this out in my scene. And then down here in my search bar, I'm gonna type in UMB. And that's gonna bring up the parameter for infinite extent unbound. Now what this basically is doing, as I start laying in some of the parameters inside the post press volume, anything that's engulfed on our scene is gonna be affected by the parameter changes that I make. If you don't click this on, you can see there's a volume box right there and only the stuff that's within a volume box will actually be changed. So if you wanna have like this kind of process everything in the scene, you definitely need to check mark this infinite extent unbound. And so anything that I make now in these changes down here is gonna affect everything. So let me pull up my details panel so it's a little bit easier to see. So the post process volume, I mean, that could be like a session all in itself. You could do cool stuff in here, like add like natural lens flares. Like if I come over here to bloom, hit convolution, then if I play through my scene here a little bit, 
you can see we're starting to get hit with some natural lens flares and stuff like that. So you could turn that on and change those attributes, but I primarily want to use it right now just to turn down my exposure settings because Unreal Engine by default is kind of simulating like how the real world exposures would be. So like the best case to kind of reconcile with it is like, you know, when you're inside of a house and you go outside and your pupils kind of have to adjust to the sun, so it might be a little bit brighter. Unreal Engine is kind of doing that by default. So by adding like a post press volume and then coming down here and just changing your exposure settings to just like an even one and one, that's going to take that away and that's going to give us absolute lighting. So any lighting that you want to do from this case on is going to look the same exact way in your viewport than it does inside your final render as well. And so moving down, I'm going to actually just type in motion. I'm going to turn off motion blur because I want to have my render be sharp so that I can do compositing inside of After Effects from here. Then I'm going to click on Save All. It's just a habit that I got. And I think everything is good from there. So actually, I want to add maybe like a rectangular light to my scene just to kind of light it up a little bit here in the front so it's not so dull. So I'm just going to come up here to Lights. Let's add a rectangular light. And let me pop out of my camera here, double click on rectangular light so I can move around. Then I'm just going to actually have this front facing on my scene here. So let's rotate this all the way around, I think like even 270. And then I'm going to change my barn doors on my light. So I'm just going to expand this. So it pretty much engulfs the entire scene here or the entire logo. So let's say maybe like 610. something like that. So let me play through one more time. And there we go. So let's say that we're happy with how everything is looking inside of Unreal Engine. And we want to add that final piece to the puzzle where we have the actual footage playing within the faces here and everything. And we're going to do that by bringing it over to Unreal, or not Unreal Engine, but After Effects, or in some cases, some people use Nuke or Fusion. But this is going to work no matter with post process application that you're going to be using. So what I'm going to do is actually set this up to render out crypto mats, which is another feature that was added maybe like a year or two ago, but it's helped out a lot of us inside the motion graphics industry. So what I'm going to do from my sequencer, aka my timeline, is I want to click on the clipboard here, and that's going to bring up our movie render queue, in which this is where we're going to set all of our settings up for rendering. And so once you do it here from the sequencer, it's automatically going to populate it with the recent job that you're working in. And so I'm going to hit on unsave config. And this, this is where I'm going to start adding like some of my multi-pass rendering attributes. So I'm going to delete the JPEG. Oops, I think it went. There we go. So I'm going to come over here to settings. And then I'm going to add an EXR because this is the way that we can actually render out an image sequence, but have like all of our multi-pass rendering assets compressed into one file. If we would have did it a PNG, you know, everything is gonna render out in its own separate pass. And so this is a cool way where we could compress everything, save space, and I'll show you guys how we can actually extract this inside of After Effects once we bring it in. And so I'm gonna come back here to settings, and I'm gonna come down here to deferred rendering reflections, cause I'm gonna render out a reflections pass and then I'm going to come back up here to settings again, and I'm going to do object IDs. Now, object IDs, this is basically going to be your crypto mats. And there's a whole plethora of different ways that you could control this. I usually just do full and let Unreal Engine work its magic on picking out the, the locations of the crypto mats. It usually does a pretty good job, but you can actually export them based on like the materials or if you have it like layered, you know, inside of a folder. There's a whole plethora of different ways of doing it. But the easiest way is to click full and let Unreal work its magic. And then one last thing we have to do is come over to deferred rendering and we have to turn on two more things just to make sure that our crypto mats will render out. So if I come over here to additional post-process materials, if I come down here to index zero, I'm gonna click that on and I'm gonna click on index one as well. And this will activate your crypto mats and everything will be engulfed inside of your EXR. So from here, I'm gonna come back down here to output, I'm just going to run, I'm going to make a new folder on my desktop. Let's name this one pre-render, like so. Then I'm going to double click on that. And then under file format, I'm just going to probably name this one UEFest. 
So right here where it says sequence name, I'm going to name this one, oops. I want to make sure that it's inside the brackets. That's very important there. I'm not sure why it keeps going up and down like that, but yeah, so UEFS and then dot frame number, and that's going to keep it in line with our sequence number. And then right here for output resolution, I'm just going to do 1920 by 1080, and everything else should be good from here. So I'm just going to click on accept. And then there's one last thing I need to do before I actually render this out, and that's add a camera cuts track. So without a camera cuts track, it's actually not going to render out at all within the camera. It's just going to do like the basic view from the viewport. So this is very important. Actually, let me think because I'm like sharing my screen mirrored. It's acting a little bit crazy, but let's see if I do it like this. Okay, so down here in the lower left-hand corner, I want to make sure I'm on frame zero, and then I would come right here where it says track. I want to add a camera cuts track, and then I just want to make sure I select my camera. Now, the camera cuts track is interesting because if we wanted to do like maybe like linear storytelling within like the scene here, like if we had several different cameras, you can actually use Unreal like a nonlinear editor. So if you're used to like being in Blackmagic Resolve or like Adobe Premiere, it kind of works in the same way. So you can actually set up different tracks in here to um, represent different cameras and you can actually set it up and edit it and then render it all out in one pass instead of rendering out separate cameras and different passes. But that's a whole session for itself. So we're just going to use it just to render out this one pass right here. And once you have everything in there like so, I'm just going to hit render local. And this should just take a few moments to render out here. Now, if you wanted to, you could do something like add anti-aliasing. If you wanted that in your scene to make it a little bit more crisp, which should still be suffice whenever you're rendering in real time. But I mean, I'm using a laptop right here. Everything is moving pretty smooth and we're still getting good frame rates out of it. So actually there's one thing I do want to change on there. I noticed that the camera was a little bit blurry on there. I'm not sure if you could tell on that screen. So I'm going to actually render that out again, which is, that's the cool thing about Unreal. Like I was able to render it out fast enough that I was able to see a problem inside the preview and I could just go back and re-render it again in no time flat. So I'm going to come down here to my focus settings and where it says focus method, I'm actually going to disable it because I just wanted it to be sharp throughout the entire duration of my camera move there. I think it has some type of wrap focus thing going on there, which I didn't want. So I'm actually going to come back to my desktop and I'm just going to delete all those frames that I just rendered out right there. And I'm just going to render it again, which should happen in no time flat. So make sure I hit save and everything. Save all, render local, and we're going to let this render out again. And then from here, we have a couple more moments left before Q&A. So I'm going to quickly show you how we can take this EXR sequence into After Effects. Oh, did it cut out? I'm going to show you how we can bring this into After Effects, and we could use the crypto mats, and we could use the multi-pass rendering to bring in the reflection layer as well. So while we're doing that, I'm actually just going to open up After Effects. Then we're going to close down Unreal Engine here in the background. Give us a second to pop up. Okay, now with After Effects open, let me close this out. I'm going to hit Control I, and I'm going to import out the pre render that we just had. And I'm going to make sure that I have Open EXR Sequence clicked on just to make sure it imports our sequence is one um, animation file instead of just one file. If you don't have that clicked on, it's not going to bring it in as an animation sequence. And then by default, for some reason, After Effects usually brings it in at 30 FPS. So I'm going to right click, just interpolate my footage, make sure that it's at a solid 24. And I'm just going to bring this down into my timeline to make a composition. So now as we play back, you can see that we have our logo animation fully intact. If I click on this, you can see we actually have an alpha channel with it as well, and we still have it lit with an HDR. Now, if you want to actually pull mats from this logo right here, we could just come over to effects and presets and type in crypto, and that's going to bring up this attribute for a crypto mat, in which now you can see we have crypto mats on our logo there, which we can actually just select any of these mats here and pull a mat from it that we can actually use as a track mat for our footage. So if I have this selected and I hold down the shift key and I select this right here, 
Now you can see we have a map for that. And if I come down here to RGBA, now you can see that we just pulled that from our logo. Now we want to use this maybe to have like our footage encompassed inside of it. So if I come over and I just import maybe some of that Fortnite footage. So let me come over here, drag this in real quick. Then I'm going to make this a track map. So now we have like our footage playing within our logo. And that's just pulled in from the crypto mat that we brought in from Unreal Engine. So you can see where this is starting to become really powerful because you don't have to do any masking manually. Like the mask just came over from Unreal. So if I click and drag that underneath, now you can see our footage is living within the side there. And let's say that I wanted to have it live in the side and the top. So I'll come back over, reset my crypto mat, and you could just left click, shift, and select all the different mats that you want. And then if I come back down here, the mat at RGBA, now it's engulfed in those mats as well. And then I'm able to leave my bevel separate. And yeah, that should be good there. And then one last thing before we stop, I'm gonna show you guys how we can pull in that reflection pass. And so I'm gonna come back over here to my effects and presets, come down here to 3D channel, and I'm gonna click on extractor. And this is actually going to extract data from the AXR file. So if I come over here to layers, reflection pass only, now you can see we have only the reflection pass that's pulling or that's being pulled from the EXR. If I come down here into my color modes and click on screen, now you can see we have a reflection pass on top of our logo. And you can see where this is starting to really come in handy because now we're able to just extract this data from the EXR file that we pulled over from Unreal Engine. And yeah, the possibilities are limitless of how we could use this. So I know. I want to thank you guys for watching my presentation here. You can learn how to do this and so much more on my YouTube channel. That's youtube.com slash Jonathan Wimbush. And until next time, stay fresh, keep creating, and I catch you guys at the next conference. I see you soon. Take care. Thank you, Epic Games and Unreal Engine. Greatly appreciate it.